Yeah, that happens. That's been happening. That's not. I hate that. But thanks for coming back. We're gonna finish, finish it up. Where the heck was I? Mm. Okay. Okay. So those members who aim at getting a house of their own receive cottages by lot as they are completed and the appropriate extra rent serves for the amortization of the purchase price. The remaining cottages are then either let or sold. The building society, however, assuming that it does good business, accumulates a large or smaller sum which remains the property of the members, providing that they keep up their contributions and which from time to time, or when the society is dissolved, is distributed among them. among them. This is the life history of nine out of 10 of the English building societies. The others are bigger societies, sometimes formed under political or philanthropic pretexts, but their chief aim is always to provide the savings of a petty bourgeoisie with a more profitable mortgage investment at a good rate of interest, with the prospect of dividends as a result of speculation in real estate. The sort of clients these societies speculate on can be seen from the prospectus of one of the largest, if not the largest, of them, the Birkbeck Building Society, 29 and 30 Southampton Buildings, Chancery Lane, London, whose gross receipts since the ex its existence total ten million five hundred uh, thousand sterling, which has over four hundred and sixteen thousand in the bank or invested in state securities, and which at present has two or twenty one thousand four hundred and forty one members and depositors, um, introduces itself to the public in this following fashion. Most people are acquainted with uh, the so-called three-year system of, a of the piano manufacturers according to which anyone hiring a piano for three years becomes the owner of the piano after the expiration of that period. Prior to the introduction of this system, it was almost as difficult for people of a limited income to acquire a good piano as it was for them to acquire their own home. Year after year, uh, such people paid the higher money for the piano and expended two or three times as much money in this way as the piano was worth. <coughs> but what is feasible with regard to a piano is feasible with regard to a house. However, as a house costs more than a piano, a longer period is necessary to pay off the purchase price in rent. In consequence, the directors have come to an agreement with house owners in various parts of London and its suburbs, as a result of which they are in a position to offer the members um, of Birkbeck Building Society and others a great selection of houses in all parts of town. The system according to which the board of directors intends to work is the following. It will let these houses for twelve and a half years at the end of this period, providing that all the rent has been paid regularly, the tenant will become the absolute owner of this house without any further payment of any kind. The tenant can also contract for a shorter space of time with higher rent, for a longer space of time with a lower rent. People of limited income, clerks, shop assistants, and others can make themselves independent of landlords immediately by becoming members of the Birkbeck Building Society. I like how, like, a mortgage, like, they're saying it's 12 years for a mortgage, but now it's fucking 30 years. 30 years. 30 fucking years. Jesus Christ. 
That is clear enough. There is no mention of workers, but rather of people of limited income, clerks and shop assistants, etc. In the addition, it is assumed that, as a rule, the applicants already possess a piano. If, in fact, we have to do here not with workers, but with petty bourgeois and those who would like uh, and are able to become petty bourgeois, people who whose income gradually rises as a rule, even with certain limit, even within certain limits, such as clerks or employees in similar occupants or occupations. The income of the worker, however, is the best uh, in this best case, remains the same amount, or in the best case remains the same amount. And in reality, it falls in proportion to the increase of his family and its growing needs. In fact, few workers can take part in such societies, and then only in exceptional cases. On the one hand, their, their income is too low, and on the other hand, it is too uncertain uh, a character for them to be able to undertake responsibilities for twelve and a half years ahead. They can't commit to that shit. The few, uh, the few exceptions where it is not valid are either better paid workers or foremen. We add here a little contribution on the way in which these building societies, and in particular the London building societies, are managed. As is known, almost the whole of the land on which London is built belongs to a dozen aristocrats, including the most eminent, the Duke of Westminster, the Duke of Bedford, the Duke of Portland, etc. They originally leased out the separate building plots for a period of 99 years, and at the end of that period they take possession of the land with everything on it. Then er, They then let the houses on shorter leases, 39 years for example, with a so-called repairing clause according to which the leaseholder must put the house in good repair and maintain it in such condition as uh, as soon as the contract has progressed thus far the ground landlord send his architect to and the district surveyor to inspect the house and determine the repairs necessary these repairs are often very considerable and may include the, uh, the renewal of the fo the whole frontage or of the roof uh, etc 30 years of financial slavery, for real. What about some Trotskyism? <laughs> oh, we're going to pass. <laughs> the leaseholder now deposits his lease as a security with a building society and receives from this society a loan of the necessary money up to... Uh, 1,000 and more in the case of annual rental uh, or of 130 to 150 for the building repairs which are to be carried out at his cost. Posadism, that's true. Only Posadism or GTFO. <laughs> po posadism, pohappyism. Ah, got him. These building societies have thus become an important intermediate link in the system which aims at securing the continual renewal and maintenance of habitable conditions in London's housing or houses belonging to the landed aristocracy without any trouble to the latter at the cost of the public. And this is supposed to be a solution of the housing question for the workers. Pfft. For the rest, it is clear to everyone that this Bonapartism of the workers' town in Mulhausen are nothing more than miserable imitators of the petty bourgeois English building societies. The sole difference is that the former, in spite of the state assistance granted to them, swindle their clients far more than the building societies do. On, their whole, uh, on the whole, their terms are less liberal than the average existing in London, and whilst in England interest and compound interest is reckoned on each deposit, on the latter also can be withdrawn at with a month's notice. 
The factory owners of Mulhausen put both interest and compound interest into their own pockets and repay no more than the amount paid in by the workers, in hard-earned five-franc pieces. And no one will be more astonished that difference, I I at this difference. Ah! Okay, hold on, hold on, I'm going to read this again. And no one will be more astonished at this difference than Herr Sachs, who has it all in his books without knowing. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> what does it mean, Blot, to call somebody... Um, hello, Rec. Thanks, thanks for being here. Um, Machiavellian. What does that mean? What do the, what do people mean? I, I I know it's like I don't feel like it's a compliment. I feel like it's they're like being negative about it, but I don't know what it means because whenever I look up Machiavellian, it kind of looks dope, but I don't know. <laughs> Evil. Evil mastermind. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Coming from the person that it came from. But, yeah. Okay. Evil mastermind. Yeah, do you remember who called me that, Moreau? <gasps> what were you gonna say and it was CB who called me that <laughs> lovely thing to say <sighs> okay No, it wasn't Chris Brown. <laughs> Where someone was like, Stalin isn't a communist, he was Machiavellian. <laughs> Self-serving. Yeah, that's silly. Yeah, it was Chris Brown. The one quote from Machiavelli I liked was something about not injuring somebody else unless you intend to destroy them completely. Otherwise, you only make an enemy of who you might seek revenge. That's actually very interesting. Hey, welcome in, Aelis Drift. Is this really your first time chatting? Either way, welcome in. That's my strategy in rest. <laughs> For real. <laughs> yeah, I'm still streaming. I wanted to finish up the um, the reading. Yeah. That's some Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu shit. Yeah, okay. So now I have to go yell at CB because I knew he was saying something nasty. <laughs> so rude. Okay, where are we at? Thus, workers' self-help is also no good. The remains, uh, there remains state assistance. What can her sex offer us in this connection? Well, three things. For real. First of all, the state must take care that in the, its legislation and administration, all those things which in any way result in accentuating the housing shortage among the working class are abolished or appropriately remedied. Consequently, revisions of building legislations and freedom for building trades in order that building shall be cheaper. But in England, building legislation is reduced to a minimum. The building trades are 
as free as the birds in the air, nevertheless, the housing shortage exists. In addition, building is now carried out so cheaply in England that the houses totter when the cart goes by, and every day some of them collapse. Only yesterday, October 25th, 1872, six of them collapsed simultaneously in Manchester and seriously injured six workers. Damn, therefore, that is also no re remedy. Secondly, the state power must prevent individuals in their narrow-minded individualism from reproducing the evil or causing it anew. That was plain English rephrasing of what we were talking about. Nice plot. We can all be caboose. Don't start shit unless you're going to finish it. That's kind of negative. <coughs> rephrasing is revisionism. Nice. Hmm. Consequently, inspections of workers... <laughs> I don't think that Machiavelli... I don't know, like, but I guess it was. What does it mean to be Machiavellian? Cunning or scheming, unscrupulous, especially in politics. A whole range of outrageous Machiavellian maneuvers. I mean, I wish. I wish. You know? Like, I wish that could describe me because I don't think it does. The ends do not justify the means. Mm. I just, I guess it depends on which means to which ends, you know? Words are hard. It, it is and it should be an insult. Machiavelli in the books The Prince describes manipulating ways to achieve any goal. Any goal? What about a specific goal? I, I feel like it's like super weird to like call somebody that just because I don't know. I don't know. Would I put many people in gulag? Like probably. But it's re-education. Y'all need to be there. I think that's fine. <laughs> On all goals. What's the definition of Machiavelli? Well, well what, it, what it says is cunning, scheming, and unscrupulous, especially in politics. A person who schemes... Suggesting uh, the principles of conduct laid down by Machiavelli. Cunning, duplicitous, or bad faith. God damn, what a fucking insult that I completely missed. That was so rude. <laughs> well, I will I can go back to that. The definition of Machiavelli is to be revolutionary in your politics. So the mansion dude is in cinema. Any and all. Any and all. That's the weird. <laughs> Manchester cinema. <laughs> I think the people in power demonized Machiavellianism uh, to take our revolutionary tool away. <laughs> A little, I don't know, 
seems way too generous to mansion and cinema, right? Okay, I'm going back to reading. Try not to dwell on Machiavelli. The terrible insult. <sighs> Consequently, inspection of workers' dwellings by the... Th Damn it. Stop writing big things for me to read. Machiavellianism, liberalism, what opportunism is for Marxism, a complete abandonment of any and all moral principles and obligation, and a sole pursuit of political power. Hmm. Interesting way to put it. What would you say... Okay, so also, so here, here is the political... The, the person giving this insult is based on ideological, like, reasoning, right? So the person is like a liberal anarchist, right? So that's where that this is coming from. Do you think that... I think that it's probably silly coming from that person. Left com. No, he's not a left com. He's an anarchist liberal. They're confused. They're very confused. It, it's, but it's floating between anarchism and liberalism. Like, that's where this person is at. It's usable like authoritarian. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. By the insults they employ. Yeah. Well, and that's something that they rail against a lot. Authoritarianism. Yeah. Indeed, since Machiavelli wanted to please the prince. Macaroni. <laughs> I think it's a bad insult because if they're actually Machiavellian, saying it doesn't matter and they're not someone you want to fuck with lightly, right? My stance is Machiavellian people are too dangerous to have peace or cooperation with, but there's some agents orange using fuckers. Oh, true, yeah. Straight up, nothing helps you understand the opponent better than their insults. <laughs> That makes sense coming from an anarchist. Right, it does, right? Like, I don't think it's insulting people as a way to grow conversation. To just kind of push, well, well, this is like uh, my friend. <laughs> friend. Doesn't sound very friendly. <clears throat> we have ideological differences. Neo leftist. Yeah, um, we're not always nice, but if you're nice, we're nice. That's how we work here. I'm sorry you tried to debate. <laughs> yeah, we don't debate here. I have debated once and it was terrible and like I don't I don't do it. So. Yes. <sighs> Okay. The first law of 1855, the Nuisance Removal Act, oh, what a terrible thing, uh, remained, as her Sachs admitted, a dead letter, as also did the second law of 1858, the Local Government Act. Uh, on the other hand, her Sachs believes that the third law, the Artisans' Dwelling Act, which applies only to towns with populations of over 10,000, certainly offers favorable testimony to the great understanding of British Parliament and social matters. But, as a matter of fact, in contention does no more than offer favorable testimony of the utter ignorance of Dr. Sachs in English matters. That England, in general, is far in advance of the continent in social matters is a matter of course. England is the motherland of the modern large-scale industry and capitalist er, the capitalist mode of production has developed here most freely and extensively of all its consequences show themselves here most glaringly of all and therefore it is here also that they first produce a reaction in the sphere of legislation 
The best proof of this is factory legislation. If, however, Herr Sachs thinks that an act of parliament only requires to become legally effective in order to be carried out immediately into practice as well, he is making a great mistake. And this is true of the Local Government Act more than any other act, with the exception, of course, of the Workshop Act. The administration of this, this law was entrusted to the urban authorities, with, er, which almost everywhere in England are recognized centers of corruptions of all kinds, nepotism and jobbery. Jobbery is the exploitation of a public office to the private advantages of the official or his family. If, for instance, the direct, director of the state telegraphs of the country becomes the sleeping partner in the paper factory, provides this factory with timber from his forest, and then gives the factory order for supplying paper for telegraph office, then that is a fairly small but quite a pretty job in as much as it demonstrates a complete understanding of the principles of jobbery, such as the rest in the case of Bismarck was a matter, of course, to be expected. Note by Engels. So it's, he's just describing what jobbery is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was like, uh, yeah. Sorry, blah. I love you now, though. <laughs> I just... Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know it was a different stream. They kept calling me a chud because I believe in the Second Amendment. Ha 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 ha! I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just meet people by, like, yelling at them. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sal. Fuck you. <laughs> That's fine. I, I meet all people in a very argumentative state. That's just me. <sighs> it's just Machiavellian, you know? I'm just kidding. I'm misusing that word. Oh. Okay. Where are we at? On the other hand... Oh, wait. The agents of these urban authorities who owe their positions to all sorts of family considerations are either incapable of carrying into effect such social laws or disinclined to do so. On the other hand, it is precisely in England that the state officials who are entrusted with the preparation and carrying into effect of social legislation are usually distinguished by a, a strict sense of duty although in a lesser degree today than 20 or 30 years ago. In the town councils, the owners of, of unsound and dilapidated dwellings are almost everywhere strongly represented, or either directly or indirectly. The system of electing these town councils according to small wards makes the elected members dependent on the pettiest local interests and influences. No town councillor who desires to be re-elected dare vote for the application of this law in his constituency. It is comprehensible, therefore, with what aversion this law was receiving almost everywhere by the local authorities that up to the present it has, all, uh, it has been applied in the most scandalous cases, and even then, as a general rule, only as the result of the outbreak of some epidemic, holy fuck, such as in the case of smallpox ep epidemic last year in Manchester and Salford. Appeals to the Home Secretary have, up to the present, been effective only in such cases, 
for it is the principle of every liberal government in England to propose social reforms, reform laws only when compelled to do so, if at all possible, to avoid carrying into effect those already existing. The laws in question, like many others in England, has only the importance that in the hand of the government, dominated by or under the pressure of the workers, the government which would at last really administer it, would be a powerful weapon for making a breach in the existing social state of things. <laughs> Alice Drift. That's funny. <laughs> Remember when Lennon straight up said, yeah, Kotsky sent me a shitty letter. I'm not going to respond to it. Bye. <laughs> that was so fucking funny. <laughs> it's macaroni and do argue into friendship. Sal is a studied macaroni. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> I like argue with people and then like I like them after. <laughs> Maybe I should skip the first part. <laughs> In more left and social, uh, I'm more left and socialist. I think that capitalism will fall soon. Oh no, we'll have to make it fall. It's not going to just fall by itself. My first impression of everyone is that they're nice enough to meet my mama and if I find out they're not they can get fucked oh let's see <laughs> liberal fuck liberal fuck conservative yes capitalism is the problem what are the values that you personally believe in caboose The Bill of Rights could be seen as some nice flowery ideas that don't actually mean anything in practice. True. <sighs> Pretty secure in my beliefs. A lot of things I've thought about, I've talked about, have come true. What have you read, Mr. Mailman TV? Okay. Actually, I'm going to have Caboose on soon. He reads people's mail. I love it. Read all the people's mail. What do you mean? What rights you do deserve? Oh my god, are you guys getting into the Discord and talking? God. You're so silly. Empire Falls, the way capitalism works is, to put simply, one person has to stand on top of ten. You're right. You're right. You're exactly right in, in the way you're describing it. But it's not just going to fail, right? I mean, they're going to hold on to it until it's taken away and something else is put into place, right? And that's why... As racist as the Declaration of Independence was, the formative precursor of the Bill of Rights, I'm suspect. But human rights was a con concept only put out by the most exploitative, slave-mongering countries. It's a poor way to go about lifting up humanity. Yeah, human rights. Human rights that they uh, acknowledge people should have and then they fucking step all over them. That's just gross. Oh, you're plugging interviews you've done because you're self-centered okay <laughs> perfect <sighs> okay there we are I swear we're gonna finish this soon almost done Thirdly, the state power must, according to Herr Sachs, make use of all positive means as its disposal to remedy the existing housing shortage to the most comprehensive extent. 
That is to say, it must build barracks, truly model buildings, for its subordinate officials and servants, but these are certainly not workers, and grant loans to municipalities, societies, and also to private persons with the view to improve the housing conditions of the working class. As is done in England under the Public Works Loan Act, and as Louis Bonaparte has done in Paris and Mulhausen. But the Public Works Loan Act also exists only on paper. The government places at it the disposal of the commissioners a maximum sum of 50,000 sterling, i.e. sufficient to build at utmost 400 cottages. That is to say, in 40 years, the total of 16,000 cottages or dwellings for at the most 80,000 persons. A drop in the ocean. If we assume that after 20 years the funds at the disposal of the commissioner were to double as a result of the payment that therefore during the past 20 years of dwellings or 20 years dwellings for a future 40,000 persons have been built the whole still remains a drop in the ocean as er, and as the cottages have an average life of no more than 40 years after 40 years, the liquid assets of 50,000 or 100,000 must be used every year to replace the most dilapidated and oldest of the cottages. Here Sachs declares on page 203 that this is carrying the principle into practice correctly and to an unlimited extent also, and with this confession that even in England and to an unlimited extent the state has achieved Next to nothing, Dr. Sachs includes his book, but not before having delivered another moral homily to all concerned. In recent English Acts of Parliament giving the London building authorities the right of expropriation for the purpose of new street construction, the certain amounts of consideration is given to the workers turned out of their homes, a provision has been inserted that the new buildings must be erected to be suitable for housing those classes of the population previously living there. But five or six story tenement barracks and therefore erected for the workers on the least valuable sites in the way the letter of the law is complicated or er, is complied with. It remains to be seen how these buildings will serve. The workers are unaccustomed to them, and in the midst of the old conditions in London, they form a completely foreign development, and in the best case, however, they will provide a new dwelling for hardly more than a quarter of the workers that were actually evicted by the building operations. It is perfectly clear that the existing state is neither able nor willing to do anything to remedy the housing difficulties. The state is nothing but the organized collective of power of the possessing classes and the landowners and the capitalists as against the exploited classes, the peasants and the workers, <coughs> the peasants and the workers. What the individual capitalists and it is here only a question of these because it is a matter of or matter the landowner who is concerned acts primarily as a capitalist, do not want. Their state also does not want. If, therefore, the individual capitalists deplore the housing shortage, but can hardly be persuaded, even superficially, to... What the fuck word is this? Palliate. Palliate to make make less severe or unpleasant without removing the cause palliate okay uh okay so superficially or, or superficially to palliate its most terrifying consequences so it's saying it's not like fixing them it's just We need humans left, not human rights. <laughs> Got them. So 
Socialism means the working class of the power. In, in full tonight after we're done. Haha! <laughs> yeah. You want me to lose my voice? Yeah, free speech is nonsense bourgeois idea that is not followed in practice. You're not even allowed to criticize your boss under capitalism, whereas in socialism you have that power. That's true. <laughs> oh, you're a communist? Recite every theory now. You're actually a bad employee if you don't criticize the people you work with. For real. Yeah, people owning uh, other people's houses should not be a thing. It should not be legal. <sighs> Voices are bourgeois decadence. What is that? Does that mean it's not really helping you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, it does mean that. It just means they can't fix me, so they just make me a little bit more comfortable and don't try. <laughs> it, it is. That does mean they're not really helping you. Shit. I'm so sorry, Blot, with whatever you're going through. I'm sorry. Thanks for following. Yeah, you need to be there for to translate Hayes when he does his solo streams. I'm gonna convince him to let you on. <laughs> Okay, at the most, it, uh, it will see to it that the measure of superficial pollution, which has become standard, is carried out everywhere uniformly. And we have already seen that this is the case. But, one might object, in Germany, that er, in Germany the bourgeoisie does not rule as yet. In Germany, the state is still, to a certain extent, a power hovering independently over society as a whole, which for that very reason represents the collective interests of society and not those of a single class, such as a such a state can can certainly do much in the in that a bourgeois state cannot do, and one could expect from the something quite different on a social field also. That is the language of reactionaries. In reality, the state as it exists is at present in Germany is also the necessary product of the social basis out of which it has developed in Prussia and Prussia is now decisive there exists side by side with a landowning aristocracy which is still powerful and a comparatively young and markedly very cowardly bourgeoisie which up to the present has not won either direct political domination as in France or more or less indirect as in England. Side by side with these two classes, however, there exists further a rapidly increasing proletariat, which is intellectually highly developed and which is becoming more and more organized each day. We find, therefore, in Germany, alongside of the basic conditions of the old absolute monarchy, an equilibrium between the landowning aristocracy and the bourgeoisie, also the basic conditions of modern Bonapartism, an equilibrium between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. 
but both in the absolute monarchy and in the modern Bonapartist mo monarchy, the real governing power lies in the hands of a special caste of army officers and state officials. In Prussia, this caste is supplemented partial, er, partially from its own ranks, partly a lesser aristocracy owning the entailed estates, more rarely the higher aristocracy, and least of all from the bourgeoisie. The independence of the caste, which appears to occupy a position outside, so to speak, above society, gives the state of semblance, uh, the semblance of independence in relation to society. I have a lisp. Do I have a lisp? <laughs> oh my god. He traded up. That's so funny. Okay. <clears throat> the state form, which has developed with necessary logic in Prussia, and following the Prussian example in the new imperial constitution of Germany, out of these contradictory social conditions, is pseudo-constitutionalism, a form of which is at once both pre uh, the present-day form of the dissolution of the old absolute monarchy and the form of existence of the Bonapartist monarchy. In Prussia, pseudo-constitutionalism from 1848 and 1866, only concealed and brought about the slow decay of the absolute monarchy. However, since 1866, and still more since 1870, the transformation of social conditions and thus the dissolution of the, s the old state has proceeded openly and in view of all tremendously increasing scale. The rapid development of industry, and in particular the stock exchange swindling, has dragged all the ruling class into this whirlpool of speculation. The wholesale corruption imported from France in 1870 is, developed, or is developing at an unprecedented rate. Strasbourg and Perrier take off their hats to each other. Ministers, generals, princes, and the counts deal in shares in competition with the cunningest stock exchange. Oh, God. And the state recognizes their equality by conferring titles on the wholesale exchange. The rural aristocracy who have been industrialists for a long time as the procedures of beet, sugar, and distillers had long ago left the old and respectable days behind and now swell the list of directors of any and all sorts of sounds and unsound joint stock companies. The bureaucracy is beginning more and more to, dis to despise embezzlement as the sole means of improving its income. And it's turning its back on the state and beginning to hunt after a far more lucrative post on the administration of industrial enterprise. Those who still remain in office follow the example of the superior and speculate in shares or participate in railways. One is even justified in assuming that the lieutenants have also their hands in certain speculations. In short, the decomposition of all the elements of the social or of the old state and the transition from the absolute monarchy is in full swing, and with the next big trade of indus industrial crisis, not only will the present swindle collapse, but the old Prussian state as well. 
Even today, 1886, what holds together uh, the old Prussian state and its basis, the alliance of the big landowners and the industrialist capitalists sealed by the protective tariffs of solely the fear of proletariat, which has grown tremendously in numbers and class consciousness since 1872. And this state, in which the non-bourgeois elements are becoming more bourgeois each day, it is, sol uh, it is to solve the social question, or even the only the housing, or, or even only the housing question. On the contrary, in all economic questions, the Prussian state is falling more and more into the hands of the bourgeoisie. And if since 1866 legislation on the economic field has not been even more adapted to the interests of the bourgeois than was actually the, uh, the case, whose fault was it then? The bourgeoisie itself is chiefly responsible, being firstly too cowardly to press its own demands energetically, and secondly resisting every concession immediately to latter simultaneously gives the menacing proletariat new weapons. And if the state power, i.e. Bismarck, is attempting to organize its own bodyguard proletariat in order thereby to keep in check the political activity of the bourgeoisie, what is that but a necessary and familiar Bonapartist recipe which pledges the state to nothing more as far as the workers are concerned than a few benevolent phrases and the utmost to a minimum of state assistance for building societies a la Louis Bonaparte. The best proof of which of what the workers have to expect from the Prussian state lies in the utilization of the French milliards, which have given the new short reprieve to the independence of the Prussian state machine in regard to society. Has even a single tailor of these milliards been used to provide shelter for the Berlin working class, uh, working class families which have been thrown on the streets? On the contrary, as autumn approaches, the state even caused to be pulled down those few miserable huts which had served the workers and their families as temporary shelters during the summer. The five milliards are being expended rapidly, enough for fortresses, cannons, and soldiers. And despite Wagner Don von Dummerwitz, <laughs> Dummerwitz, his name is Dummerwitz, Wagner von Dummerwitz, <coughs> uh, and despite Stiber's conference with Austria, there will not be you. Uh, there will not be used for the German workers even as much as those milliards, as was used for those French workers out of the millions which Louis Bonaparte stole from France. Okay, I'm so close to being done. Shit. In reality, the bourgeoisie has only one method of solving the housing question after its fashion that it is to say of solving in it in such a way that the solution continually reproduces a qu the question anew. This method is called Haussmann. By the term Haussmann, I do not mean merely that specifically Bonapartism manner of the part Parisian Haussmann breaking long, straight, and broad streets through the closely built workers' quarters and erecting big, luxurious buildings on both sides of them. The intention thereby, apart from the strategic aim of making barricade fighting more difficult, being also to develop a specifically Bonapartist building trades, proletariat depending on the government, and then and to turn the city into a pure luxury city. By Haussmann, 
I mean, the practice which has now become the general, uh, which now became, blah, 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 which has now become general of making breaches in with the working class quarters of our big towns, and particularly in those which are centrally situated, quite apart from whether this is done from consideration of public health or for beautifying the town or owing to the demand for a big centrally situated business premises or owing to the traffic requirements such as laying down of railways, streets, um, no matter how different the reason may be, the result is everywhere the same. The scandalous alleys and lanes disappear to the accompaniment of lavish self-praise from the bourgeoisie on the account of this tremendous success, but they appear again immediately somewhere else and often in the, uh, in the immediate neighborhood. In the condition of the working class in England, I gave a description on the man uh, of Manchester as it looked in 1843 and 1844. Since then, the construction of railways through the center of the town, the laying of the new streets, and the erection of the of great public and private buildings have broken through, laid bare, and improved some of the work district described in my book. Others have been abolished altogether, but many of them are still, apart from the fact that official sanitary inspections had since become stricter, in the same state or in an even worse state of dilapidation than they were then. On the other hand, however, thanks to the enormous extensions of the town, whose population has increased since then by more than half, districts which were at the time still airy, dry, and clean are now just of, as excessively, excessively built on, just as dirty and overcrowded as the most ill-famed parts of the town formerly were. Here is just one example. On page 80 and the following pages of my book, I describe the group of houses situated in the valley bottom at the River Medlock, which under the name of Little Ireland was four years one of the worst blots on Manchester. Little Ireland has long ago disappeared and on this site now stands a railway station built on high foundation. The bourgeoisie printed with pride to the happy and final abolition of Little Ireland as a great triumph. Now, last summer, uh, a great inundation took place. As in general, the rivers embanked on in our big towns cause extensive floods year after year owing to these easily understood causes. And it was then revealed that Little Ireland had not been abolished at all, but had simply been shifted from the south side of Oxford Road to the north side, and that it still continues to flourish. Let us hear what the Manchester Weekly Times, the organ of the radical bourgeoisie of Manchester, has to say uh, in its number one of July 20th, 1872. The misfortune which befell the inhabitants of Lower Valley of the Medlock last Saturday will it is to be hoped have one good result, namely that public attention will be directed to the obvious mockery of all the laws of hygiene, which has been tolerated there for so long under the noses of our municipal officials and our municipal health committee. A forcible article in our daily edition yesterday revealed through hardly trenchantly enough the scandalous conditions of some of the cellar dwellings near the Charles Street and Brook Street, which were reached by the floods. The detailed examination of one of the courts mentioned in this article enables us to confirm all the statements made about them and to declare that the cellar dwellings in this court should long ago have been closed down, or rather, they should never have been tolerated as human habitations. Squire Court is made up of seven or eight dwellings on the corner of Charles Street and Brook Street, even at the lower, lowest part of the Brook Street, under the railway bridge and pedestrian 
the p a pedestrian pass or a pedestrian may pass daily and never dream that human beings are living under his feet and what are little more than caves jesus christ the court itself is hidden from public view and is accessible only through uh, only to those who are compelled by their impoverishment to seek a shelter in such a self sepulchral silk sepulchral jesus what sepulchral sepulchral okay so it's gloomy sepulchral is gloomy in its sepulchral seclusion even if the usually stagnant waters of the medlock which are shut in between the locks do not exceed their usual level the floods of these dwellings can hardly be more than a few inches above the surfaces or the floors of these dwellings can hardly be more than a few inches above the surface of the river a good show of rain is capable of driving up filthy and nauseous water through the drains and filling the room with pestilential gases such as every flood leaves behind as its souvenir the squire's court lies at it uh, at a still lower level than the uninhabited cellars of the houses in brook street 20 feet lower than the street level and the foul water driven up on saturday through the drains reached the roofs we knew this and therefore expected that we should find the place uninhabited or occupied only by the sanitary officials engaged in cleaning up the stinking walls of the disinfected houses and disinfecting the houses uh, instead of this we saw a man in the cellar home of the barber engaged in shoveling a heap of decomposing filth which lay in a corner onto a wheelbarrow the barber whose cellar was already more or less cleaned up sent us still lower down to a number of dwellings about which he declared that if he could write he would have written that or to the press to demand that they be closed down and so finally we come to the squire's court where we found a bosom and a healthy oh you found a what excuse you excuse you how dare you no it's a that's breasts they found a bosom down there. Okay. <laughs> and a healthy looking Irish woman busy at the wash tub. <laughs> he found boobs down there. He's just like, I don't know. She and her husband, a night watchman, has lived for six years in the court and had a numerous family. In the house which they uh, had just left, the water had risen almost to the roof. The windows were broken and the furniture was reduced to ruins. The man declared that the occupant of the house had been able to keep the smell from becoming intolerable only by whitewashing it every two months. In the inner court uh, into which the correspondent went, then went, he found three houses whose rear wall abutted on the rear wall of the houses just described. Two of these three houses were uninhabited. The smell there was so frightful that the healthiest man would have felt sick in a very short space of time. This disgusting hole was inhabited by a family of seven, all of whom slept in the place of on Thursday night, the first day of the water rose, or rather have not slept, as the woman immediately corrected herself, for she and her husband had vomited continually the greater part of the night owing to the terrible smell. On Saturday they had been compelled to wade through the water, chest high, to carry out their children. She was of the opinion that the place was not fit for pigs to live in, but on account of the lower rent, one, one and a sixpence a week, 
she had taken it because her husband had been out of work a lot recently owing to sickness the impression made upon her or upon the observer by this court and the inhabitants huddled in it as though in a premature grave was one of utter helplessness we must point out by the way that according to the observation squire court is no more than typical though perhaps in an extreme case of many other places in the neighborhood whose continued existence our health committee should not countenance should the committee permit these places to be inhabited in the future then it is taking on to itself the responsibility whose gravity we shall not discuss further here and it is exposing the whole neighborhood to the dangers of the infectious epidemic so that was the fucking bourgeois newspaper and they 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 really did a decent job describing the conditions but for what so they can do what They're gonna fix it. Saying that freaking <laughs> how romantic. Thanks for following. Okay. Oh my god, we're almost finished. This is the last paragraph. Are you ready? This is a striking example of how the bourgeoisie solved the housing question in practice. The breeding places of disease. The infamous holes in the cellar in which the capitalist mode of production confines our workers night after night are not abolished. They are merely shifted elsewhere. The same economic necessity which produced them in the first place, produced them in the next place as well. As long as the capitalist mode of production continues to exist, it is folly to hope for an isolated solution of the housing question or of any other solution or social question or, yeah, of any other social question affecting the fate of the workers. The solution lies in the abolition of of the capitalist mode of production and the appropriation of all the means of life and labor by the working class itself. Uh, I, we could have done a, a too long uh, or TLDR of the very last sentence. <laughs> and like we could have just solved that. <laughs> like, like this is it. This is so far past my bedtime, for real. Yeah. This is a, yeah. This paragraph is the, this is the one. Yes, I'm, I'm sweepy. Right? Because a lot of people, they, they do this shit, right? Like, so th that's what pisses me off about Gravel Institute, right? They like point out all these problems and then they don't give you any solutions. They're just like, yeah, check out this problem. It's totally terrible. And then you're like, okay, what do you want people to do about it? They don't say anything. I hate that. I don't like that. That's what I'll let you know that. I know. I think that this whole night's reading could do with some TLDR. So the, the TLDR is like this it. Like if you want a solution to the housing question, you can't like do it. You cannot solve the housing question without solving like removing capitalism. Like you cannot have capitalism and solve that question. That's the TLDR. <sighs> They will not ever fix world hunger or or ho houselessness until we abolish capitalism. 
bless old Gravel of those of all the stopgap left leaders we have in my memory, he was the bravest on television. <clears throat> yeah. Libs talk about problems all the time and either don't provide solutions or provide shitty ones. Yeah. That's basically what this is about. You know, this whole thing was about, he was showing how different, um, idealist socialists solve problems, which are not solutions at all. How he, I mean, I feel like he proved that. Because the other guys were like, yo, you just give him a house and then everyone just magically becomes bourgeoisie and then we're all bourgeoisie. Fucking Proudhon. <laughs> okay, let's see. Who is on? Jackson Hinkle. Blech. Who? <sighs> Pinko's on. We always go to Pinko, but Pinko's solid, you know? Like, why change of a good thing? Okay, yeah, let's do Xanderhoff. Jesus Christ, Merle. Disgusting. <laughs> I hate syndicalism. Yeah. Oh, Proudly Radical. Disgusting. No, Proudly Radical is terrible. I do not like that person. <laughs> I mean, I don't not like him. I just don't like, like what he likes at all. I mean, he's probably a nice guy, but not for me. Yeah. Okay. Tomorrow we'll be back with how Yukong moved the mountains. And, um, and I'm going to be out of town on Friday. So you're just going to have Hayes and Reggie. And I hope that goes well for you guys. <laughs> Okay. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for listening to the thing. <laughs> no, I don't want you to read. I mean, I just, uh, I think it would be cool to like read like together, you know, like sometimes, I don't know, like chat reading with me. If I'm like alone, I think it would be fun. Thanks for being here, Rod. Yes, Comrade Voltron. Epic film series. Okay, here we go. <laughs>